Big Siders, good morning. Thanks so much for joining us for our digital worship service. I wanted to begin this morning with a note of thanks. As some of you know, my wife tested positive for COVID-19 a few weeks ago. Since that time, we have received so many notes of concern, encouragements, letters, meals. And so we just want to thank you so much for loving and caring for us so well. My wife is in good spirits, she's in good health, and is making a speedy recovery. The rest of us tested negative for COVID and then got retested and tested negative once more. So we are isolating for the next few days until we're completely out of the woods. And for that reason, Greg is filling in for me this morning and continuing our series of John. In addition, we are giving our worship team a well-deserved break this morning. For the past eight months, our team has labored diligently to provide you with worship each and every Sunday morning. So they are taking a respite today, and we're going to be showing you some of our favorite songs that have been recorded over the last eight months. Finally, as many of you know, our county has moved back from the orange tier into the purple tier. That means there's more restrictions in place now, and it also means that we can no longer meet indoors. So we are pivoting back to our outdoor services, and we'll no longer be live streaming an indoor service. Instead, we're going to be providing, once again, a pre-recorded digital service each and every Sunday morning. So all that to say thank you, we love you, we miss you, we're praying for you, and now let's rise and worship our great God who is greatly to be praised because his greatness is unsearchable. Oh 
more precious wealth that can never be told. Holy, unsearchable riches of Christ, precious, more precious than gold. Precious, more precious than gold.
I can't believe the annual Creekside Holiday Arts and Crafts Show has been canceled. Where can I go to shop for unique handmade items from local artists now? What'll I do? Oh, what'll I do? George! Are you all right? Leave! Didn't you hear? Creekside is doing a virtual craft show this year. A virtual craft show? What does that mean? It means you can still support some of the artists who would have taken part in this year's craft show by visiting the Creekside Virtual Craft Show page on the Creekside website. Learn more about the artists and visit their online shops. This is the most wonderful news! I have to tell everyone! Creekside is doing a virtual craft show this year! Hey! Creekside is doing a virtual craft show this year! Oh, darling, isn't it wonderful? We can shop for jewelry, soaps, pajama pants, lotions, journals, quilts, magnets, baby gifts, home accessories, and more. All we have to do is visit creeksidecommunity.org slash virtual craft show. Greg Arthur, one of the pastors here, and we're really glad that you're here with us today. Uh, for this next part of the sermon series that we're doing on the Gospel of John, entitled, Who is Jesus? And I have to say, I'm sort of excited today to uh, speak to you because talking about Jesus turns out to be one of the things I actually really like doing, and it's one of the most favorite things I like doing, actually. And I've loved his word ever since I was saved. And uh, the Lord knows I love to talk. And, um, well, my, just ask my wife. That's the truth. The passage today in John 12 shows how different people can see the same thing and yet respond in wildly different ways. In this case, we'll see the various contrary responses to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. What explains this? Well, the Bible says the purposes of a man's heart are like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Now, to this fact that a man of understanding will draw it out, I'm going to bypass all the experts and all the pundits and all the porch sitters and every millennial blogger and go right to the man of understanding, Jesus himself, who said this that explains it all. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I've entitled this message today, Where Your Treasure Is, because we'll see in this passage this fact. What we treasure explains our motives. And by saying what we treasure, I mean what we value, what is of most importance to us, what we most deeply cherish, 
in essence, what we love over all else. For it is true that at the very core of human nature, we will live for what we love. It's also true that we know what we treasure. It's not hidden from us. It's not even that hidden from those who know us. For what we will live for, what we will devote our lives to, it reveals just as plain as day what we treasure. So it's with this understanding that we'll look at the people in the passage who treasure in their hearts either Jesus or something else. And then we'll see how their treasure explains their response to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And then we'll apply this to ourselves, asking yourselves just where our treasure is. I have one goal for today as we go through this, that we'll be honest with ourselves. That as we hear his word and as we ponder what he's saying, what the Lord is saying through his word, that we'll be honest with ourselves. Honest about human nature. That we will be the same as everybody else. That we should admit, that we'll be able to admit it's true that where our treasure is, personally, is where our heart is as well. That we're absolutely motivated in life by what we love. That we live for what we love. In fact, that beneath everything that we say or do is devotion to what we love. And also that we would be honest about our motives. Let's admit to ourselves what it is that we love above all else whether it's Jesus or whether something else, wealth or power or politics or respect or attention or recognition, fame or free time or success or security or comfort or entertainment or living well, feeling good, being right, getting even, maybe even getting high. And let's also be honest with ourselves about the importance of Jesus. Let's admit to ourselves that it's of greatest importance that the treasure of our heart is Jesus. All right, well, let's, before we get started, let's pray. Would you pray with me, please? Lord Jesus, thank you for this day, your goodness, your love, and your mercy, the way that you take a hold of us, the way that you instruct us, lead us, the way that you form us and make us. Lord, help us to be honest with you, Lord honest with ourselves and honest with you about where we really stand, where our hearts really are. And Lord, help us to treasure you above all else. Thank you. In your great name we pray. Amen. All right, this passage concerns Mary, the sister of Lazarus, who was raised from the dead, Judas, the betrayer of Jesus, some cultural elites, the uh, chief priests and Pharisees, and crowds of commoners, in Jerusalem for the Passover. But it starts with a backstory in verse 1. Verse 1. Six days for the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. Now, this is the first time Jesus has been seen in public since raising Lazarus from the dead some months prior. And that, when he did that, caused a huge stir, as you would expect. Many saw it happen. It was obviously supernatural. You might remember how Martha said, quote, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. <laughs> to raise Lazarus after four days, and there's a stench already, is to reverse decay, remove the decomposing organisms, repair rotted tissue, remake ruptured cells, recompose molecules, return all to perfect working order, and then restore the mind and replant memories, freshen the air a little bit. No less than the laws of nature have to be supernaturally re rescinded in order to recreate Lazarus back to life, which is something only God can do. And that caused a huge stir when it happened. And now months later, it's still causing a huge stir because every time someone saw Lazarus, he would be the living sign of Jesus' unmatched power over death and absolute authority to be what he says, the Messiah King, the ruler. So everybody can see it. Every, every time Lazarus shows up, it's as if he's being raised from the dead again. So the chief priests and the Pharisees, fearing their loss of power and authority, declared in the Supreme Council, quote, 
Jesus performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So they plotted to have Jesus put to death, and they gave orders that if anyone knew where Jesus was to report it so they might arrest him. As a result, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, Jesus stayed out of sight with his disciples up in the hill country about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. Um, This is before Instagram, so it was possible to actually disappear into the countryside and the hills. But before Passover, Jesus heads straight back to where those who seek his death are, where he raised Lazarus from the dead, where Lazarus still lives, in Bethany, a town on the outskirts, just on the outskirts of Jerusalem, less than two miles east of the temple on the road. Bethany is close enough that it's probable, possible, that they could hear that trumpet shofar call sound from the temple every morning. And that's where the people who are plotting his death are. That's how close they are. In just six days, just as the Lord had planned, though, in order to accomplish salvation from sin, Jesus will be arrested and put to death and then buried for three days in a tomb to be raised by God, resurrected. But on his first day back in public, in Bethany, Jesus attends a dinner. So back to the story. In this passage, the different ways people react to Jesus raising Lazarus are signs of what they treasure in their hearts. And the first that we'll look at is Mary, the sister of Lazarus. So verse 3. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of perfume, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Now this is what treasuring Jesus looks like. When Jesus shows up for the first time since raising her beloved brother back to life, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, takes a flask of nard worth 300 days' wages and anoints Jesus' feet with it. That flask is about 11 ounces, apparently, is about 11 ounces of nard and would be worth $40,000 or so. It's so costly because nard comes from a plant that's found in the Himalayas. Um, Nard oil is easy to get now, and it's not so expensive. But back then, before Amazon Prime, a little flask of nard worth $40,000 would have had to be brought by camel or walked on foot more than 3,000 miles. It's like the distance from Oakland to New York City, over mountain ranges and across deserts, through three empires, all full of bandits and corrupt officials, before somehow, months later, reaching this little town of Bethany in the backwaters of Judea. It's so valuable that people have wondered how a young woman in the backwaters of the Roman Empire could have had such a possession. Many think it was her dowry. Back then, when a daughter married, the dowry went with her to her husband's family since she would be joining them. And this flask being so valuable means Mary's family was affluent and that means that she would have to have a substantial dowry to marry into an equally prominent family. But Mary takes this most valuable of possessions, her entire future, and she gives it to Jesus that night. In a way, she's saying to Jesus, you are my husband. (laughs) Giving all away makes it obvious that she loves Jesus above all else. For her love motivates her life. She lives for the one she loves. Where her treasure is, there her art will also be. And she, all she wants to do is love him back with all her heart. So much so that she would give to him all that she has and all that she will be. It's just such an extravagant gift. So full of joy. She loves him over finding a husband. She loves him over financial security. She loves him above the good opinion of her family and her town. It would seem simply crazy to squander your future to wash Jesus' feet. 
unless you love Jesus more than anything else, even life itself. For he raised your brother from the dead. <laughs> and it's not only an extravagant gift, but it's also a thoughtful gift as well. According to the Bible, when kings ascended to their thrones, they would be anointed with oil. For example, the Lord God commanded the prophet Samuel to go to Bethlehem and anoint David when he was a young man as king of Israel. So for her to anoint Jesus with her treasure of nard is in a way saying, you are my husband and my king. And then by anointing his feet and wiping them with her hair, she's pledging her whole self, even her beauty, to be under his lordship. It's a thoughtful gift, full of understanding of who he is. It's really an act of worship itself. And it's also a gift of thanksgiving. She gives up all she has for a few moments with Jesus. There's no sign that she's worried, though, or has second thoughts that she's made a bad decision. How could she? Jesus, out of his power and authority and his love, has raised Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus is the living sign of Jesus right in front of her. But on this night, actually no sign is needed for Jesus is right in front of her. And so she gives herself away without saying a word. It reminds me of my father's military funeral, which involved a color guard and a 21-gun salute and a flyover of jets in the missing man formation where four are flying toward us and then one peels straight up into the sky to heaven. <laughs> and then it's followed by a ceremonial flag folding, um, the final folding of his flag. It was a very moving and extravagant and thoughtful five minutes of honor, and it was all done without words, until the officer in charge presented the flag to my mother, saying only this, on behalf of a grateful nation. By anointing Jesus' feet with her treasure, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, said to him in the most emphatic of ways, without words, on behalf of a grateful daughter. For as it says in the scripture, she who offers a sacrifice of thanksgiving honors me, and, quote, whoever loses her life for my sake will find it. So what can we say about Mary, the sister of Lazarus? She loved Jesus above all else. And out of gratitude and worship and joy, she loved him back and gave him all that she had and all that she is. And this giving of herself away is the sign that the treasure of her heart is Jesus. Here's what Jesus said about her from another account. Wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be spoken in memory of her as it is today, right now. In contrast, this is what Judas, the betrayer of Jesus, did at the dinner from verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Jesus said, leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with her, with you, but you do not always have me. Now this is what treasuring wealth looks like. You know, even though Judas, just like Mary, was an eyewitness to the raising of Lazarus from the dead, Judas seems unimpressed. He's at a dinner, Lazarus is there, and Jesus is there, and yet he's unimpressed. In fact, Judas was eyewitness to even more demonstrations of Jesus' power and authority and love, having been with him for three years as a disciple. He saw Jesus feed 5,000 people with two loaves and five fish. He saw Jesus walk on the water. He saw Jesus heal countless people of diseases and afflictions. He saw a blind man see. He saw a paralyzed man walk. He knows all these things are prophetic signs of the Messiah King, and he has heard Jesus speak the beautiful words of life. So why doesn't Judas react in the same way as Mary did? By giving himself away. John tells us why in verse 6, Judas was a thief. 
In other words, Judas doesn't exactly care who Jesus is or what Jesus is doing, only what he can get from him. It's like that old Looney Tunes cartoon about the singing frog, where the workman who discovers it doesn't see a singing frog, only the possibilities of getting rich from it. Judas doesn't treasure Jesus, he treasures wealth. His greatest love is financial security. His motivation is to ride the coattails of Jesus into power and to become wealthy. And like everybody else, like every one of us, he'll give his all to the treasure of his heart. So he'll do anything for wealth. He'll lie to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. He'll defraud those who donate to Jesus' ministry. He'll skim money off for himself. He'll get indignant when Mary doesn't contribute to the fund. He'll virtue signal, saying this wasted money could have been given to the poor. He'll poison the minds of those around him. And later, he'll betray Jesus into the hands of the authorities when Jesus no longer can make him money. The one great love that motivates his life is wealth. He lives for it, and he'll die for it. So what can you say about Judas, the betrayer of Jesus? I think that we can say with certainty that he loved wealth more than Jesus. That totally explains him. It's as the scriptures say, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Now, the next group, the cultural elites, the chief priests and the Pharisees, whose power and authority over Israel was threatened by the power and authority of Jesus, did this in response to the raising of Lazarus from the dead, from verse 9. When the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to put Lazarus to death as well. Because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. This is what treasuring power looks like. They first decided to put Jesus to death. Back in earlier parts of John, we read, for, the blas for blasphemy of claiming to be God. That's what they said. But then after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, proving his validity to the claim that he is God, they plot his death for a new reason. They said that if, anyone, if everyone believes in him, the Romans will take away the nation. Now they decide to put Lazarus to death because still more are believing in Jesus. And what did Lazarus do to deserve death at the hands of the authorities? What law has he broken? All of this just shows that the cultural elites will do anything to keep their power. They will kill anyone or bend any rule, ignore any law. And that just means that their highest value, the treasure of their heart, what they love above all else is not God, not the law, not truth, not justice, not anything except power. But they will not prevail. And soon, in fact, they will lose their nation in just a few decades to the Romans, just as they were worried. For the scriptures say, woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed. Now, lastly, many commoners were also eyewitnesses back a few months prior to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And they testified to others, to each other, of what they saw. And after they testified to what they saw, and the crowds heard all about it. This is what the crowds did. Verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they had heard he had done this sign. This is what treasuring a better life looks like. The reason why we can say the crowds did not treasure Jesus like Mary did is that just in a few days, in just a few days, 
that jubilation that you can hear in this would become silence as they all fall away when Jesus is arrested. They saw the power and authority of Jesus just like Mary did, and then they set their hearts on a better life in the here and now. They found in Jesus a truly transformational political leader with the power to really better their material life. So in verse 13, when they heard Jesus was coming into Jerusalem, they lined the route waving palm branches and crying out from Psalm 118, Hosanna, which means save us, and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, adding even the king of Israel. All right, so here you can see this is Psalm 118. O Lord, do save, we beseech you. O Lord, we beseech you, do send prosperity. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. Actually, this, this psalm is a beautiful song that expresses the deepest of longings. Um, it may have even had a tune. It's arranged like this. O Lord, bring salvation. O Lord, bring prosperity. Blessed is the one coming in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The crowds are singing a song of deepest longing for the long-hoped Messiah King to come and alleviate their suffering. And on this day, they sang this song to Jesus. They see him as the one who can save them from the hardships of life, from the grinding poverty and oppression and affliction and disease that most of the people of Israel lived under. They see him as the one, some, because some saw him raise a man from the dead. And so their hearts are set on a Savior King to bring them salvation and prosperity, to bring them health and well-being, to bring them a better life. But their highest value, the greatest hope, the treasure of their hearts, isn't Jesus. It's for that better life. And who can blame them? Who doesn't desire a better life for themselves and for their families? Who in grinding poverty does not hope for prosperity? They didn't know that Jesus is the one coming to bring a deeper salvation from sin and the wider prosperity of eternal life and that to accomplish that, he would have to be arrested and put to death. So when Jesus is arrested, they no longer see how he could bring them a better life. And most will abandon him and some will turn on him because they love a better life more than they love him. But that's later. That's later in the week. On this day, they are in jubilation. And the passage ends with perhaps the truest thing any of the bystanders said about Jesus after he raised Lazarus from the dead. Verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. All right, that's the passage. It just shows different responses to Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead that arise from differing loves. The question to ask ourselves is, what about us? Where is our treasure? What do we value most in life? What do we hope for the most? What do we love above all else? I actually don't think this is a very hard question because I think deep down, if we're really honest with ourselves, we already know what it is. We know what we care about the most. We know what we love above all else. Plus, everyone knows, actually. They all know what we live for, what we devote our lives to, what's our highest value, what we will give of ourselves to. What is our treasure is just plain to see. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So, personal question is, what is your treasure? Is it Jesus? Is it one of the big competitors, wealth or power or a better life? Is it politics or respect, tension, recognition, acceptance, fame and success, security or comfort or entertainment? Is it a perfect family, perfect body? Is it feeling good? Is it being right? Is it having free time? Is it getting even or is it getting high? I think we all know where our treasure is, if we're honest with ourselves, because we know what we devote our lives to. A better question really would be, why is it so important for our treasure to be Jesus? Let's just look at one reason. 
although the Bible is full of reasons. From the same verse where Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's read. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is saying just one thing, that if our treasure is in this world, then it will pass away and disappear. And we will have wasted our love on that which does not last. And since we live for what we love, we will have wasted what we have, what we do, and what we think, our time, our efforts, our work, our gifts, our abilities. We will have wasted our sufferings, our allegiances, our hopes, our thoughts, and our accomplishments. We will have wasted our very lives. But if our treasure is in Jesus and his eternal kingdom that he brings from heaven to earth, then nothing is wasted. I think we probably know this too, if we're honest with ourselves. So the real question is, if our treasure isn't Jesus, what can we do about it? How can we treasure Jesus more? How can we love him more and the world less? Here are two things I think that we can do. First, number one, contemplation. We, have, we can contemplate his love for us. The first thing to do is to turn off our devices, go off by ourselves and spend some time contemplating how Jesus loves you. Because love for Jesus arises out of knowing his love for you. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. A start might be to contemplate just how Mary knew Jesus loved her and how she'll know more of his love for her after the resurrection and the giving of the Holy Spirit. So I've listed a few things here um, to contemplate about his love for us, his love for Mary, his love for us. First, he comes to her where she lives in Bethany. He teaches her even though the rabbis wouldn't teach women back then. He accepts her gift saying she'll be remembered for it wherever the gospel is preached. He defends her, saying to Judas to leave her alone. He enters into her sorrow and weeps with her over Lazarus' death. He does for her more than she had ever hoped by raising him from the dead. He will on the cross take away her sin and ours. He will give to her and to us eternal life. He will give to her and to himself and the Holy Spirit to be with us. He'll give to her and to us, himself and the Holy Spirit, to be with us and in us. He will teach her and us all things through the Holy Spirit. He will keep accepting her and us and keep entering into her sorrow and into ours. He will keep defending her and us. He will keep doing more for her and for us than we can even imagine. He will credit her faith in ours as perfect righteousness. He will purchase her freedom and ours from sin. Beloved, the Lord God in Christ loves us. The more we know he loves us, the more we will love him back and thereby treasure him in our hearts above all else. So that's the first thing we can do. Contemplate his love for us. Second thing we can do is to pray to pray for our hearts to love him back. So the second thing would be to turn off your devices, to go off by yourself and spend some time praying to Jesus to help us, and he will. And perhaps we might pray something like this. Would you pray with me? My Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your heart for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you treasure us so very much that you treasure us so much that you would die for us, that you would come to us, that you would teach us, that you would defend us, that you would lead us, that you would be with us, that you would not leave us orphan, that you would do all these things um, just because you love us so much. From the treasure of your heart, Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Help us, Lord Jesus, to be honest with you, O Lord, honest about where our loves are, what our treasures are, Help us, O oh Lord, to be honest. 
And also help us, Lord, to know just how much it is that you treasure us. We really do know your love for us. That it is actually just one way love. You love us, Lord. Help us. And finally, Lord, help us then to love you back. To treasure you above all else. Thank you so much, Lord. You are our Savior, our God. You are our shepherd, our companion. My Lord Jesus, thank you. In your great name we pray. Amen. All right, church, thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Um, See you next week. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever Trust.